Louis T. Welcome to the 2018 NFL Draft Wrap-Up Series where your man Louis T. aims to break down all 32 teams in the National Football League's 2018 NFL Draft using our baseball grading scale. Single, double, triple, home runs. There are no strikeouts here in the Draft Wrap-Up Series as we cannot tell how these players are going to pan out. And I don't want to discount anyone before they get their chance in the National Football League. And so we'll get a score for each and every single player selected in X said team's draft. We'll apply bonuses when necessary, divide by the number of picks, which will then yield us an overall grade for that team's draft. We'll then move on to the next team in the series picked by you. That's right. You, the viewer, are in total control as this is the you pick format. Simply be the first to leave a comment in this in future videos in this series stating two things. The phrase next in the team you'd like to see next. Some examples would be Indianapolis next, although I would advise against that little wordy, probably going to get you beat. Nonetheless, Colts next, Indy next, a lot shorter, a lot more to the point. That sounds like a winner to me. You get where I'm going with this. As a matter of fact, the next team up in the series is none other than the Indianapolis Colts, a team that is right now going through what I like to call the Ballard transformation, as in GM Chris Ballard cleaning this organization up, turning over the roster, and cleaning and washing away the stench that was left from the old regime run by GM, ex-GM Ryan Grigson. And so uh, we've seen a lot of players out the door that have been mainstays of this Colts roster over the last two years. Uh, they got rid of a bunch of veterans last year. Some failed draft picks like Bjorn Werner uh, got moved on from. And, and, and now you, you're seeing them. They traded away Dwayne Allen. And now they released a guy like Jonathan Hankins, who just signed a, a freshly inked deal not too long ago. So uh, they didn't re-sign uh, some of the players that you thought maybe in the past they might have resigned if, uh, you know, the ex-GM uh, uh, Ryan Grigson had been there. Uh, like a Dante Moncrief. So, so you, you see the wheels turning here. Colts are doing things differently. They're going in a different direction. And they've made some free agent acquisitions. They've added some uh, guys via the draft last year. And I thought their draft last season was exceptional, the first of which uh, that GM um, Chris Ballard was responsible for. I thought this was a really good draft. Not as juicy as the one last year, but this one to me was more quantity over quality, and I think GM Chris Ballard would disagree with me on that because he doesn't think that he got any less quality out of this draft uh, with the quantity picked up by making some of the moves that he made, uh, obviously most notably moving back three spots in the draft from three to six and picking up additional second-round selections. However, um, one thing's for sure. This is a draft that is going to go a long way in turning this thing around quickly. If they get this right, I'm not saying that they're going to have the same ramifications and impact of what the Cowboys did in the late 80s that sparked the early 90s resurrection of the Dallas Cowboys where they made all of those uh, that trade for Herschel Walker or traded Herschel Walker to the Vikings, got all those picks, and that turned into Emmitt Smith and Troy Aikman and all of those guys and some of the, uh, the guys that they ended up drafting helping them win all those championships. I'm not saying that, but this could take a, a really destitute Colts franchise, one that I think is starving for talent, one that I thought going into last year was one of the least talented teams in football, could turn it around relatively quickly. And so this draft could go a long way in doing that, or this draft, if it doesn't turn out to be what they hoped it would be, uh, could stunt the growth of this franchise even more so. This is a big draft for them. You draft 11 guys, of which I think all 11, if not 11, at least nine of these guys are going to make this Colts final 53-man roster when it's all said and done because you have a new GM that wants to make his imprint on this roster. You're going to see most of these guys make the team. If these guys don't pan out, this organization is going to be in trouble for years to come. Obviously, it all starts and ends with the health of Andrew Luck. But nonetheless, let's talk about this 2018 NFL draft because it's a very extensive one. 11 selections made. Let's jump into this thing. We start in the first round, sixth overall selection, offensive lineman out of Notre Dame. Quentin Nelson is the selection. Not going to lie to you, I'm a little biased, okay? I am a Notre Dame Fighting Irish fan, so um, I have an affinity for Quentin Nelson. It's been a joy watching him over the last... Uh, three years uh, just dominate 
uh, the line of scrimmage at Notre Dame. And um, whether it was Ronnie Stanley next to him or uh, Mike McGlinchey next to him, the left side of our line was always well taken care of. And a large part of the reason why was because of Quentin Nelson. More so than Ronnie Stanley, more so than Mike McGlinchey, this guy was the rock that held that Notre Dame offensive line together. Um, sort of like Zach Martin, there was just a level of comfort um, watching him play, knowing that this guy was going to open up some gaping holes, and that he did for the duration of his career, not to mention protecting whomever the Irish had back at quarterback, and there's been a number of guys he's had to protect during his three years as Notre Dame uh, offensive guard. Nonetheless, um, I always called him the crock pot. All right, Quentin Nelson for me was always the crock pot because I said he cooked defensive linemen low and slow. All right, he always came off the ball nice and low, won the leverage battle. That's why guys could never push him back and, and really uh, get that anchor off base. And in the run game, he'd come off low and blow guys back off the line of scrimmage and create a new line of scrimmage. And he beat their ass for three quarters. And by the fourth quarter, that nice, slow, methodical approach of just kicking a guy's ass wore, wore in and it ultimately defeated a guy's will to fight, and he would just destroy guys late in games. So um, called him the crock pot because he cooks defensive linemen low and slow. And I expect him to do much of the same at the next level because this guy is the consummate professional. That being said, let's jump into Quentin Nelson, 6'5", 325, out of Notre Dame, 35 reps of 225. The guy's a beast, 34-inch arms, 36 career starts, 31 straight to finish his career at Notre Dame, and he was also a team captain. Do not dismiss the fact that the man was a captain. Always love when guys are a captain at their schools. It means that they have a level of maturity, and they're guys that are guys you can trust on and off the field. That being said, measurables, 6'5", 325. I mean, that is what you're looking for from an offensive lineman right there. I mean, 6'5", 325, pitcher-esque. If you ask me, um, athleticism, uh, he moves really well for a guy that's damn near 330. I mean, he can pick him up and put him down, and it's his ability to move that allows him to not only get out in front when he's pulling and create space, but also be able to make some of the blocks that he was able to make while at Notre Dame. I've got one that always comes to mind. It's my favorite block maybe of all time watching college football of any player um, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in any event. Um, technique, technically sound, I put down. He's got one flaw, and it's the one thing that um, he does from time to time. It's not something he does all the time, but he does do it um, quite a bit. And that's he ducks his head sometimes when he's about to initiate contact. Sometimes he doesn't see what he's about to hit. Um, it's not uncommon for guys at impact to close their eyes. This is no different than that except he's literally not even looking at the target as he's about to make contact, which means a guy could easily sidestep him at the last second and he wouldn't really know. Uh, but again, generally, I'm nitpicking here. If you're talking about this guy's technique, it's rock solid. It's what you're looking for. And so um, I don't really have any issues or qualms about what this guy is from a technical standpoint. Anchor, it's, it's as good as you're going to find in this draft and really any other draft for that matter. This guy just doesn't get, get beat with bull rushes. Simple as that. I, I've never, I don't know if I've ever seen him beat with a bull rush. I've seen him beat with quickness off the snap once or twice before, but it's rare, but it happens, you know. But to, to beat this guy with a bull rush, something's got to happen. Someone's got to trip him. Um, he's got to get his feet entangled with someone. It, it just doesn't happen very often, with, if ever, with Quentin Nelson. He just doesn't get beat with a bull rush. Um, balance is impeccable. Again, um, I love watching this guy just do what it is he does. You know, sometimes a guy will, will, will win um, the leverage battle and he'll just bow his back. He'll just bow his back and all of a sudden he's winning the battle and he's able to stop the bleeding before it really even starts. Um, it, it, like I said, it's just fun to watch this guy. Balance is outstanding, um, as I mentioned. Redirect, solid for a guy his size, a guy 330 to be able to, to move and change the direction of his body. Guy beats him going to the outside and then goes inside and he's able to turn his body or he catches a guy coming late on a blitz and he's able to redirect his frame and go get him. 
Um, that's rare for a guy that's damn near 330 pounds, yet that's what Quentin Nelson brings to the table as well. Toughness, um, this guy's just tough as nails, um, <laughs> which leads me right into finish. Finish him. Dun, dun, dun. This guy finishes with the best of them in this draft. And there's some nasty mofos in this draft. So I don't want to make it seem like he's the nastiest of them all. But he's right up there, man. I mean, this guy is disgusting with the way he handles defensive linemen, um, linebackers, safeties, corners, you name it. I mean, ragdolling some of these guys, spilling them on, on their dome and just falling on top of them with no mercy, you know, Extra syrup on top, and he wants some butter, too. It, it, it's fun to watch him finish off blocks. Uh, that is for certain. Uh, run blocking and pass blocking are both great strengths of Quentin Nelson. Um, for me, his run blocking supersedes his pass blocking. I think the run blocking has the, has the chance to make him a, a Hall of Fame player. If he stays healthy... His ability to create a new line of scrimmage is what makes legends. You know, um, watching him on tape is it's just so fun to watch him take a guy and move him three yards against his will. Um, hard to do. They get paid too on the other side of the football, um, and it, it didn't matter. You know, they get a scholarship just like he does. He didn't care. Uh, some of those people have kids too. You know, but again, Quentin Nelson. He's what you're looking for in the run game. And he does protect the quarterback, too. Let's not act as if that's not a part of his job description. And, and he does that equally as good. Um, but to me, the run blocking um, is what has a chance to make this guy legendary. Awareness. My favorite block in college football history. And I know I'm going a little overboard here. But if you haven't seen this block, treat yourself to one of the most egregious decleatings. I don't even know if that's a word, but we're going to make it a word tonight. Decleatings of a blitzing safety that you will ever see in your life. <laughs> they, they, uh, there's a safety, Reed, for Georgia that was coming, screaming like a bat out of hell, um, out of nowhere, off the pace, to come and clean up the quarterback. Quentin Nelson spots him at the last minute, turns, pivots, and this is what I'm talking about with the redirect, turns, pivots, and just molly -wops him. I mean, takes the man fully off of his feet, knocks him in the next week. It is the, the most beautifulest thing I've ever seen on a football field from a blocking perspective. Um, I, I watched that play at least 20 times. It's that good. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, speaking of which, looking for work is one of the categories that I have. When you're a guard or an interior offensive lineman, for that matter, you got to look for work. You're not always going to have someone to block. It's not like you're a tackle where on every play there's someone for you to block. Sometimes there's just there's no work for you. Go find work. You know, go look for work. And for Quentin Nelson, um, he's a guy you don't have to tell him go look for work. He's searching for work. He's seeking it out. And on that particular play, um, that poor safety, Reed, boy, I tell you, man, he got a whole can of whoop ass and then some on that particular play. And it was just simply Quentin Nelson doing what he does, which is look for work. And I was so pleased watching him against NC State, looking for work and seeing Mike McGlinchey over there having his hands full with Bradley Chubb. And not to say that Chubb was getting the best of McGlinchey on that particular play, but it doesn't matter. It's Bradley Chubb. I don't need to go help my center. I'm going to go help my tackle with Bradley Chubb. Just knowing the situation, knowing who is where and what you need to do and who you need to help. I can't tell you how many times I watch guys go help someone that doesn't need help and allow a guy that does need help to get beat. It's good, just good to know that this guy's aware enough to know, okay, Bradley Chubb's over here on my left. I'm going to go help Mike McGlinchey. You got this guy over here. I'm going to go help Mike McGlinchey with Bradley Chubb. Just makes a lot more sense. Uh, double teams. Deadly on the double team, uh, clowns to the second level effortlessly, man. I mean, it's his ability to, to combo a guy, get to the second level, and wash that guy out of the play that opened up so many lanes um, for uh, Josh Adams at Notre Dame last year. I mean, Josh Adams at one point 
was in the Heisman Trophy discussion. Why? Not because Josh Adams was a dynamic back, but because there was some gaping holes and all Josh Adams had to do was run straight really, really fast. And a lot of times, it was behind the ass of Quentin Nelson opening up holes and getting multiple guys on one play. I'm pulling, uh, there's a play against NC State where he pulls out to the sidelines, takes Bradley Chubb into the sidelines, two, three yards into the sidelines. That's Quentin Nelson in a nutshell. Um, availability, guy really doesn't miss many games. Um, didn't miss a couple of games. I think it was in 2015 or so, I believe it was. Missed, might have even been this year. I don't remember. I think it was, it was last year where he missed uh, part of a game and, and uh, another game. But the guy generally doesn't miss games. Obviously, there's no negatives here because this was one of the top five players, irregardless of position, in this draft. Um, Quentin Nelson, to get him at six, again, like I said before, in a normal draft where quarterbacks aren't flying off the board like hotcakes, you don't get Quentin Nelson at six. It just doesn't happen. In a normal draft, Quentin Nelson is off the board. And again, we're talking a guard. It's so rare for guards to go this high in a draft, but Quentin Nelson isn't an ordinary guard. In a normal draft, this guy's going top three. You got lucky that you were able to trade back from three to six and still get a guy like Quentin Nelson. Could you have gotten Bradley Chubb? Eh, maybe he would have served you better. But look, how long have we been saying you need to protect Andrew Luck? We've been saying that since the man got drafted. Here's a guy that's going to make sure that that happens. You want to take some of the pressure off Andrew Luck? You want to run the football more effectively? You want to be able to have some big plays where Andrew Luck doesn't have to be the centerpiece and focal point of your offense? Quentin Nelson is going to allow you to do that. And so I love this pick. And I love the fact that you were able to trade back, pick up additional second rounders, and still get a guy that's going to be the linchpin of your offensive line for years to come. Love the move. You pair him up now with um, the center you took out of Alabama, and all of a sudden the interior of your offensive line looks like new money. <sighs> Smells like it too. In the first round, sixth overall selection, offensive lineman out of Notre Dame, Quentin Nelson is, you already know what this is. It's right high. It's a deep. It is high. So we move on to the second round, and this next pick, 36th overall linebacker out of South Carolina State, Darius Leonard, was hotly debated. I'm here to put those debates to rest. So when I heard the name Darius Leonard called with that 36th overall selection, much like most people watching the draft, I went, huh. Now, some people went, who? I knew who he was. I didn't know what he was about, though. And, and there's a difference about knowing who someone is and knowing what they stand for on the football field. They're, those are two different entities. I knew who he was. I didn't know what he stood for on the football field. So at the time... I, much like a lot of people who didn't know, and when you know, you know, I didn't know. So I questioned the Colts' decision here. Second round pick, you got two in a row, and this is what you do with it? Man, I couldn't have been further from, from wrong or further from right. Let's get into Darius Leonard. I don't even know if I got it right just now. Who cares? Let's talk about Darius Leonard and what he brings to the table. 6'2", 234, out of South Carolina State. And don't let the South Carolina State fool you. This guy was supposed to go to Clemson, okay? He thought he was going to go to Clemson to join his brother, his half-brother, on that Clemson roster. Clemson jerked him around and tried to ask him to walk on. They didn't want to give him a, a full ride. So he said, you know what? Take my talents to another school in South Carolina. I don't need you. I'll go get a full ride from South Carolina State. South Carolina State, Clemson, yeah, it's a little bit of a drop-off. Okay, no, it's a, a big drop-off, but still. Uh, he went there, and he handled business, and voila, he's a second-round pick. 
Four seven forty. I'm not buying that for one second. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about that in a second. Twenty reps of two and a quarter. Thirty-eight inch vert. So the guy is athletically gifted. Uh, career stats: fifty-four tackles for loss, twenty-two sacks, eight and a half of which came in 2017. That was a career high. Six ints, nine PBUs, and eight. Yes, eight forced fumbles. Guy was a menace in the MEAC conference. So, measurables at 6'2", 234. Like I've said numerous times, breaking down multiple linebackers. That's the new going rate in the NFL. Um, if you're looking for an athletically gifted linebacker, it's rare to find one that's 245 pounds. It's one to, rare to find one that's 250 pounds. You look for these guys that can cover tight ends, that can run over the middle of the field, Guys that can blitz, can do multiple things. You want one of those guys that can do some of everything, then he's probably going to be in that 230 to 237 pound range. Leonard fits that description. So don't have any problems with his measurables. Speed guessed wrong on a screen and gave up a big play, but tracked the running back down from behind. Now, I don't know how fast that running back was, but uh, according to his 40, that he ran at the combine. It was a 4-7. Um, I'm not buying. He's a 4-7 guy. I'm just not. I I've seen 4-7. I know what 4-7 looks like. He is not 4-7. He's a lot faster than that on game day. And uh, and he's dealing with uh, some issues with, with his ankle at the time uh, of the uh, his pro day and whatnot. So he decided not to um, run the 40 again. He just stood on those numbers. Look, I'm telling you right now, the guy's not a 4-7 guy. He's in the I'd, – I'd venture to say that he's low 4.6s. He might even be high 4.5s. Four, uh, four so either way, um, he's much faster than 4.7. And later on in this draft, you drafted a couple of guys that run 4.6, 4.5. This guy puts those guys to shame in terms of speed and quickness and acceleration, range, all of it. So I'm not buying the fact that this guy's 4.7, but nonetheless – um, athleticism, acceleration, redirect, all exceptional with Darius Leonard. And can you imagine just you being the guy on your football team? You're the guy. Everyone knows that they have to double team and they have to block you. And still knowing that you still make all the plays that Darius, Darius Leonard was able to make, it's amazing watching him on tape do some of the things he did. Like this next play, awareness. I put down a forced fumble versus UCF on a run. So Darius Leonard jumps the wrong gap he takes away the outside takes away the c gap running back goes up the b gap so he's at a disadvantage running back cuts it up the field and he's he's up to about a gain of 12 darius Leonard tracks him from behind sees he's got the football a little loosey-goosey says oh he doesn't want those cookies man let me get those cookies yum yum eat them up yum yum eat them up knocks the football loose oh it's on the ground scooped up by south carolina state Darius Leonard making a play at the time uh, of the game where it was getting away from his team. Now, they ultimately got their ass whooped like 56 to nothing or whatever it ended up. But at that time, they were still hanging on by a thread. They needed something good to happen, and Leonard provided that for them. Uh, that's the kind of awareness that he has. He sees a guy holding the football, loosely comes in, and tomahawks it out. And that's what he brings to the table. Uh, shed and slipping blocks. Does a great job of shedding blocks. Um, a lot of linebackers don't do a good job, especially guys that are undersized. When I say undersized, I'm talking south of 240, 245. They, do a, they generally don't do a good job of shedding blocks. It's hard for them to disengage. Granted, he played in the MEAC conference. Not a lot of those guys are getting invitations to the combine or making it to the NFL, even though they did have a guy by the name of Brandon Parker drafted by the Raiders that did make it uh, to the NFL this year. Uh, still, not a lot of those guys are coming to the league. So uh, maybe that had a little bit to do with it. But nonetheless, it, just the fact that he's able to shed the block of a 300-pound or 285-pound offensive lineman still speaks volumes about this guy's ability to get to ball carriers. Um, his tackling ability is outstanding as a tackler, and he does it in a, a nice form way. Yeah, he can blow you up, but he can also come and wrap you up. But a lot of guys... They, they're losing the art of just wrapping a guy up and getting him down on the ground. They want to come in with forceful shoulders, and yeah, that works in college. You, you get to the pros, and these guys are, are benched 
pressing and and squatting houses. That that doesn't phase them. Your shoulder, they just bounce off of that and they continue to pick up additional yardage. This is a guy that's going to wrap you up and get you down on the ground. So um, love his ability to tackle. Um, man coverage ability, I put down in my notes, he took away a screen in man coverage. I was watching him in a game where they wanted to run uh, a wide receiver screen, and he had that receiver in man-to-man -man coverage. He saw it, he identified what was going on, and he jumped it. And the quarterback had to tuck it and run. And it, it was just an example of Darius Leonard uh, thinking the game, seeing what's happening and reacting and, uh, and preventing something from happening before it happens. Too many linebackers sit back and watch things develop before they react. Darius Leonard was proactive instead of reactive. Um, zone coverage, he can drop in the zone. Uh, again, eight, uh, six career INTs, that's not by happenstance. When you do some of the things that this guy is capable of doing, you end up in the right place at the right time. And when you're in the right place, the right time in football, generally you're rewarded with things happening in your favor, like fumble recoveries, like interceptions, and things of that nature. Uh, blitzing capabilities. I love, love, love this guy as a blitzer. The 22 sacks speaks volumes for what this guy is capable of as a blitzer. Um, I, I watched him in a game versus Southern, and this was so gorgeous. He, he was looping in. He, he stood up in a two-point stance as a rusher on the edge, and there was four down linemen, and he was um, standing up, and he ran a, a, a stunt. He looped inside on a stunt. The running back tried to cut him as he came inside. And I got to give credit to that defensive lineman for occupying two blockers. He did his job on that play, allowing Darius Leonard to loop inside and uh, come free. But still got to get past the obstacle of the running back. I know too many linebackers that blitz and can't avoid, run over, or just disregard the running back. They get blocked, they get stuck, and the quarterback has enough time to get rid of the football. Not Darius Leonard. Sees the running back, sees that he's trying to cut him, jumps over him, Superman style, sort of like what Jonathan Allen did last year, um, and sacks the quarterback in one smooth motion. Man, was that pretty. And um, that, that's what he brings to the table. You don't get 22 sacks by just running up. I'm going to run up the A-gap, and this running back is going to block me, but I'm still going to get there somehow, some way. No. I'm going to find a way to get there. Whether I got to loot this guy, I got to spin off this guy, or I got to run him over, whatever I got to do, jump over him, I'm going to get there. And that's what Darius Leonard did on that play. And that's how you get to 22 sacks in your collegiate career as a linebacker. Uh, range, sideline to sideline ability, man. This guy was everywhere for South Carolina State. And so um, this is the kind of player the Colts needed, man. And at 36, I wasn't sure of what the hell Chris Ballard was doing with these picks at first. But as I went back and looked at some of these players and where they were selected and I looked at who was still on the board, this was a damn good selection one. One that the Colts desperately needed. That defense needs a makeover. It started last year by getting some of the players you got last year. And I think it's going to continue this year with some of the moves made in this draft. You're getting younger. You're getting faster, more talented. And this is a guy that's going to be one of the anchors of your defense, I think, for a long time. And I really like this selection for the Indianapolis Colts. In the second round, 36th overall, linebacker out of South Carolina State, Darius Leonard, for me, is... It's right high! It's a deep! It is out of here! So you get to the very next selection in the second round. This is what happens when you trade back, pick up picks, and... Uh, you have a, a dearth of picks in the second round. Um, one of many for the Indianapolis Colts, 37th overall offensive lineman out of Auburn. Braden Smith is the selection. So there was a question as to whether Braden Smith should have been the pick here. Were there other guys on the board that would have been better? For this Indianapolis Colts team, some people thought Connor Williams would have been a better selection than um, Braden Smith if you were going to go offensive guard. Hell, I actually prefer Braden Smith over Connor Williams. I didn't have a problem with that. But my thing was, why, why didn't you take a guy like Tyrell Crosby? And even though he didn't go into the fifth round when the Detroit Lions finally took him off the board, Tyrell Crosby, to me, would have been a better fit for this Colts team because 
of the versatility, his, his ability to play both tackle and potentially kick inside the guard. He didn't get beat for a sack the entire year last year, did, uh, you know, Crosby. So I just felt like that would have been a better fit for a Colts team that just are still mixing and matching pieces up front. Uh, I know you like, you know, the kid that you got uh, a couple of years ago um, in the draft as, a, as your um, right tackle, and he's been really solid for you. Uh, but eh, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Braden Smith, though, I like him. You know, I'm not going to kill you for the pick because I like Braden Smith, and I think he's a damn good football player. But um, you know, 6'6", 315, uh, out of Auburn, started as a true freshman. So uh, this is a guy that came on to the scene uh, with a bunch of accolades and um, lived up to the hype. 35 reps of two and a quarter. I talked about him during my combine coverage about how this guy looked like Tarzan. I mean, just well put together. One of the most well put together offensive linemen I've ever seen in my life. Pause. Um, 33 and a half uh, inch vertical, 9-4 broad, 41 consecutive starts to finish his career. Has experience starting at both right guard and right tackle, albeit only one start at right tackle. Nonetheless, still the start. But 40 of those starts came at right guard which is where he's probably going to play for this Indianapolis Colts football team. Measurables, like I said, this guy looks pitcher-esque. When you look at an offensive lineman and how you want him to be sculpted, he looks like Braden Smith. And this guy was a shot put champion in high school. And so he looks the part of a guy that just eats, breathes, and sleeps, waits. I mean, his body is sculpted again, pause. But um, he looks the part of an offensive lineman. Um, So his measurables off the charts. Athleticism moves extremely well for a guy his size. I was really surprised um, at the combine when I saw him move, how well he moved. And, and I said, man, this guy's going to make for a hell of a guard at the next level with his movement skills if the tape matches the movement skills. And fortunately enough for you guys, tape matches the movement skills. Uh, technique, it's pretty solid in his technique, but I did put this down in my notes. Overextends at times, lowering his head and getting his shoulders out too far over his toes, causing an imbalance. And when I saw him get beat on tape, and there was about a couple of times, maybe two or three times where I saw him get beat on tape, it was because he didn't move his feet. Instead, he he opted to lunge, got his shoulders way out in front of his toes, knocked him off balance. Guy was able to swim move him, beat him uh, to the quarterback. So um, it doesn't happen very often, but when he does get beat, that's generally what I saw from him as a mistake. Anchor, balance, redirect, toughness, all check marks there for Braden Smith. Uh, pass blocking ability, um, he's really solid in the pass blocking department. I did see him get beat by Christian Wink- Wilkins on a quick swim move. Uh, again, um, look, that guy's going to be a stud. Uh, it's Christian Wilkins for Clemson, but um, who didn't get beat by him at some point? But nonetheless, um, he was pretty rock solid as a guard. I watched him against Alabama. I watched him against Georgia. He held his own in all those games. As a matter of fact, he dominated versus Georgia, opened up some gaping holes in that football game uh, and allowed um, Auburn to beat Georgia and did the same thing in the Bama game. So this, this guy's battle-tested, played in the SEC where um, it's a different breed out there, man. And he held his own week in, week out. Um, Awareness, finish, both solid for awareness. I put down in my notes, though, sometimes he has to be more fluid and less of a robot. So I I gave the example of uh, the Georgia game where Georgia is showing overload blitz to the left. He's the right guard, so they slip protection to the left. Um, Georgia ended up bluffing blitz to the left and ended up coming from the right. And obviously you see that. They're literally on this particular play where three offensive linemen standing with their hands by their sides doing nothing while two Georgia defenders came scot-free from the right side. And one of those guys was Braden Smith. And at some point you've got to look, recognize that they dropped and immediately focus your attention on the opposite side because they're trying to dupe you. Guy runs right by, I mean, literally he could have, Just poked his finger out and touched the guy. He came that close to Braden Smith, had no clue he was coming until the air from him went by by the guy running past him, and his quarterback was under duress. And it's that kind of situation where you got to be a football player. 
you know, okay, you, yeah, they slip protection, but they're not coming from that side. Now you've got to realize where they're coming from and pick a guy and get a piece of him. He didn't, and he caused his quarterback to take a shot. Um, spatial awareness, looking for work, he does that. Um, double teams, he, he's solid on that as well. Um, pulling, he was exceptional. And I love his, his hop step, his skip step. When he comes out of his um, – Stance and is he has that little that hop step that those guards take um, to get to where they're going. It's so tight and compact. It's there's no motion wasted. It's so nice and neatly um, done. That path that he takes that the running back doesn't have to wait, doesn't have to hesitate. Um, it's so well done um, by Braden Smith. Availability a guy pretty much started every game of his collegiate career. Um, you know, there were a couple of games in there where he was just getting his feet wet, but uh, Brandon Smith, it's a good pick, you know, really good pick. And for a team that we've been screaming for years to get the help you needed up front for uh, Andrew Luck, I think you might have it now. You've got both guard positions locked down now with these two selections. You got the center position locked down with the pick you made last year or two years ago, one or the other. Um, and now you look at that interior, it's locked up. Um, and you still got um, uh, Denzel Good was the guy that I was mentioning earlier that you liked that's at right tackle. And I believe you still got Anthony Costanzo at, um, at, left, guard, at left tackle. So the, the offensive line, which has been a problem and a sore spot for the Colts, might finally be fixed. And um, like this selection, in the second round, 37th overall selection, Offensive lineman out of Auburn, Braden Smith for me is. So I talked about some of my confusion with some of the selections in the second round uh, with the Colts. And this was another one of those picks because I didn't know, I questioned. But when you know, you know. And now I know. So. I have less questions about the player, and now I have questions about your ability to get the most out of him. Because if you do, you got a stud on your hands. If you don't, then you wasted a second round pick. In the second round, 52nd overall selection, edge rusher out of Rutgers, Kamiko Ture is the selection. Kamoko Ture is a guy that I watched on tape in the first game that I watched. Boy, did he pop for me. I put on the Washington game, and I remember I was out of town when this game was aired originally, when it was played. I was out of town, and I remember watching Rutgers hang in that game for about three quarters before they wet the bed. And a large part of the reason why is because guys like uh, Kamo Kamiko uh, Ture Kamoko Torre, excuse me, was wreaking havoc in that game. And I want to see that guy more often. And it's your job in Indianapolis to get it out of him. 6'5", 253, 80-inch wingspan. 18 reps of two and a quarter, 34-inch vert, 4'6", 5'40", very twitchy and explosive. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Career stats, 20 tackles for losses, 15 and a half which were sacks, four pass breakups, a forced fumble, and three block kicks in his career while at Rutgers. Now, he had two shoulder surgeries before the start of the 2016 season. I don't think he was right, all 2016. And so... Um, wasn't as productive. His first year on campus was his most productive, if you can believe that, which usually is a bad sign, but he looked a lot more healthy in 2017, and I'm going to tell you right now, from what I saw in some games, and I watched him in quite a bit of games because I wanted to get a good feel for this guy because I wanted to see just why this guy was selected, where he was selected, when he was selected, and um, you could have something here. So let's jump into him. Measurables, um, 6'5", 253, that's a solid size. If you're playing a 3-4 defense as an edge rusher, that's good size. 
you can defeat tight ends at 253 pounds with an 80 inch wingspan. You can win that matchup. And if you got to go against tackles, you still got a shot. And um, we'll talk about him going up against tight ends and tackles a little bit later on. But this is what I want to talk about right here because this is what I see in him that the Colts have lacked um, at, for, which, at, which, at, with edge rushers over the last five years. You know, since the, the combination of Freeney and Mathis, you haven't had explosiveness and athleticism off the edge. And now I think you may have two guys that can provide that with you, uh, for you in Terrell Basham, who you took last year, who I absolutely loved and still do and think if you can't get the most out of these two guys as a tandem, you don't maximize their talents. You don't have the right coaching staff. I'm putting this on you guys. The onus is on the Colts organization to get the most out of two guys that I think can be dominant at the next level in Terrell Basham and now uh, Kam- Kamoko uh, Torre. So, I watched the Washington game. I watched him come off the snap, blow by guys, absolutely wreaking havoc, making tackles for losses, hurrying the quarterback, just being an absolute nuisance. And if you want to see Kamoko Torre in all of his splendor, turn on the Washington game from 2017. You'll look at him and you'll say, damn. 58 is a problem. Hand usage, he needs, again, he's fine-tuning some things. He needs to learn how to use his hands, much like most guys that come out of college that don't use their hands. Uh, He needs to learn how to use his hands more. And, again, I'm putting the onus on the Colts organization and staff to to get the most out of this guy. Um, Setting the edge, I put down in my notes, able to stand ground versus tight ends and tackles, and even keeps one arm free at times. He did it versus Michigan State beautifully. And that's what you're looking for. When a guy's setting the edge in the run game, if you're forcing the running back, if you're spilling it, it's called spilling a play. You're spilling it back inside, which means you overplay outside to make sure that the guy goes inside to your help. You're going to spill it back inside. Then you want to you attack the inside shoulder of that tackle. All right? You really want to go aggressively there, and you want to use your outside arm to do it because you want to keep your inside arm free so that you can get a piece of the running back as he's going by. If you want to you want to force him outside, you want to keep – or he's going to go outside and you can't quite get there, you want to attack the outside shoulder of that tackle or tight end, and you want to keep your outside arm free so you can get off and make a tackle. And if you don't, you might be able to draw a holding penalty. Either way, I saw him do this. A lot of guys don't do that. And so that was really impressive as well. Redirect is really good. His ability versus the run, I just kind of touched on that. But, yes, I, I loved him in the run game. Saw him make some beautiful plays where he was able to knife into the backfield and get tackles for loss or blow up some plays. So very aggressive around the line of scrimmage. Uh, pass rushing ability, he's got some juice, man. He has the juice that is necessary to be a problem at the next level. He just doesn't quite know how to harness that yet. He's getting there because I saw a spin move. I got excited when I saw the spin move. He's got some stuff, but there's work to be done. And again, I know I've said it a million times, but I'm I'm putting it on that coaching staff to get it out of him. Uh, Tackling ability is solid as well. Really good motor and endurance. Um, Impact on the game is solid. And... Let's get to his cons quickly. Awareness. He, he's not quite as aware as I would like him to be. Um, there was a play that really irked me. And these are the types of plays you need guys to make. So against Washington, they're in the game. It's 13-7. to 7. They're in the game. And remember I told you they started to wet the bed late third quarter into the fourth. This was one of the plays that third down, they got him right where they want him, got a chance to force a field goal, stay in this game. And... Uh, Moko Ture is not rushing on this play, essentially. He, he kind of slow plays it off the line, and the running back leaks out. And the good ones, they recognize it quickly, and they run with that running back and take that option away. He looks at the running back, watches him run all the way to the flats with no one checking him, and then decides late, I'm going to rush the quarterback. Why? You're not going to get there and impact this play. Do something impactful. Take away the primary option of the uh, the quarterback at this point. He doesn't go out there, 
Quarterback recognizes it. Jake Browning throws an easy touchdown pass to Coleman. It's 20 to 7 at that point, and the route was on from there. And I thought that was a play that could have been avoided if Toure would have just simply um, ran after the running back. And it was easy enough to do it. I've seen guys do it all the time, uh, and I've seen them do it before, and he just failed to do so. Um, pass rush plan. He doesn't have one right now. He's not setting guys up. He's just trying to win with explosiveness. That's a damn good trait to have and try to win with. But um, at the next level, if he's going to succeed, he's got to start setting guys up. He's going to have to use the spin more move, uh, spin move more, and he's going to have to start to use his hands to defeat blocks. And after he blows by guys, because there were times where he would win initially off the snap, but didn't use his hands to finish the job, and guys would be able to get back into the play and push him around the pocket. I want to see this guy and all of his talents honed properly. Him and Terrell Basham have a chance to turn into a dangerous one-two punch in this league, similar to what the Chargers have in Joey Boza and Melvin Ingram. That could be the Colts' defense in three years if they do it right. They have the talent now with Ture and Basham. I'm looking for results, and I won't settle for anything less. If those guys don't mature in that Colts system, something's wrong with that system. Um, bottom line, because those guys are talented. And so in the second round, 52nd pick overall, edge rusher out of Rutgers, Kamoko, Kamiko, whatever, Ture is. I'll get this name right, though. In the second round, 64th overall pick, your fourth, count them, fourth second round selection in this draft out of the Ohio State University, edge rusher Ty Quan Lewis is the pick. Six three two sixty nine stands. Taekwon Lewis, four six nine forty, ten seven broad, thirty five inch, thirty five and a half inch vert. So uh, again, athletically gifted there. Um, career stats: thirty six and a half tackles for loss, twenty three and a half of which were sacks, five PBUs, five for forced fumbles. Um, statistically, twenty seventeen and twenty sixteen don't look all that different. But the tape says otherwise. He was a much, much more dominant player in 2016 than he was in 2017. Um, hence, I think some people had soured on him. Nonetheless, measurables is where we start. And I, I just simply asked the question, what is this guy exactly? What is he? At 6'3", 269, is he... An edge rusher, two-point stance? Is he a hand-in-the-dirt guy in a base 4-3 defense? And your nickel sets? Because at Ohio State, they didn't really know what the hell he was. They moved this guy all around. This guy was at nose, uh, at uh, three-tech often. Guy was at defensive end. He was standing up. He was moving around left, right. You didn't know where Twaquan uh, Lewis was going to be. So I want to know what exactly is this guy because – he doesn't strike me as a guy that's going to beat many tackles just off the edge with pure athleticism, even though there is a little twitchiness to his game. But I'm not sure what this guy is. I'll be anxious to see how the Colts decide to use him. If the Colts are, continue, are going to continue to play a 3-4 defense, then I think I know what his fit is. But if not, we'll see. We'll see. Um, in any event. Um, probably looks more uh, like a base four three in to me, but we'll see what what happens. Anyway, athleticism. I've talked about his athleticism already. He he doesn't look like it. Kind of looks a little stocky, a little chunky to me. But you turn on the tape and and there are some flashes of of explosiveness, of twitchiness with this guy. Um, hand usage. He's got a little something there, and, and you can't help but have a little hand usage when. One of the Bozas is there. Now Nick is there. Joey and Nick might be the two best 
single usage of hands I've seen coming out of college football, and Nick is still there. And his hand usage is on par with his brothers, may even be better. It's ridiculous. Uh, those guys are first-degree black belts in hand fighting, and they do it so well. And just by osmosis, just by being around that guy, you got to get a little piece of that. And so Taquan Lewis has a little bit of that. Um, awareness is solid. Point of attack, physicality, he holds at the point of attack. He holds his ground so he can hold a point of attack without a, a problem. Redirects um, his ability versus the run. Put this down in my notes. Spends too much time fighting at the line of scrimmage. He'll sit there and pity pat and dilly dally with the uh, offensive lineman. I'm like, bruh, what are you doing? And then the play's over and he's still fighting with that offensive lineman. Like, bruh, you did nothing. You in the same spot you were when the play started. What are you doing? So he's got he's got to stop doing it. He's got to make progress during the course of a play. Pass rushing ability. If he wins with quickness early in the rep, he'll pressure the quarterback. Translation. If he doesn't win early in the rep with quickness, he's not going to win in that rep. So um, he's a guy that when he does win off the snap with quickness, he's going to get to the quarterback because he's got the ability to finish defeating that block with hands. If he doesn't win with elite quickness off the snap, then he's not going to win, period. Okay. Um, tackling ability, motor, endurance, all solid traits when talking Taekwon Lewis. Impact on the game. He just – always found a way to, to do something that impacted the game for Ohio State. Um, never was, to me, the guy, even though he led them in sacks for about two or three years in, in, during his career, but never really struck me as the true difference maker on their team, but he was always in the mix. Explosiveness, I put down much more explosive in 2016. I saw him run by tackles as if they were standing still in 2016. Didn't see that same guy in 2017. The most explosive I might have seen him was the first game of the season versus Indiana, where he had some some sacks, some pressures. He, was, he looked good in that game, but I didn't really see that the rest of the season versus Maryland and Penn State and Michigan and USC. These are all games I watched him in. I didn't really see that. So, um, But he had some twitchiness, but I, I really didn't see the explosiveness that I saw in 16 um, duplicated in 2017. And pass rush plan. It's solid. It's not great, but um, his quickness is going to be his calling card. If he's going to win and get pressure on the quarterback, it's going to be because of quickness off the snap. So I want to see how the Colts use him. I'm intrigued by the selection. I don't love this selection um, like I do the, the, the previous four selections, but nonetheless, in the second round, 64th overall pick um, by the Colts, Line edge rusher, defensive end out of the Ohio State University, Taekwon Lewis, for me, is. So we go back to me loving this draft as we get to the fourth round. No third rounder, but when you've had four second rounders, who needs a third rounder anyway, right? Right. So we go to the fourth round, 104th pick overall. Running back out of NC State, Naheem Hines is the selection. Man, was this fun to watch. 5'8", buck 98 out of NC State, 43840. Ouch. Man, is that guy blazing fast. Was a track star in high school and while at NC State. So you know the guy can run. 35 and a half inch vert, um, returned kickoffs every year of his career, two touchdowns in that span, uh, and then added punts to the mix in 2017 and took one to the crib there as well. Career numbers, 258 carries for 1,399 yards and 13 scores. Um, and check this out. In 17, 197 of those carries for 1,112 yards and 12 scores on the ground. So the bulk of his damage on the ground came in 2017. Meanwhile, as a pass catcher, 
89 grabs for 933 yards and a score. His best year was in 2016 catching a football where he racked up 43 catches for 525 yards receiving. So over half of his um, yards and about 40% of his catches came in 2016. So a lot of his damage in those areas were done in specific years. So this guy brings a lot to the table. And it's picks like this that I feel like the Colts are finally starting to get it. Let's take some of the pressure off of Andrew Luck. Let's get some explosive plays somewhere else other than the passing game. Let's get it to a guy in the run game on a screen, out of the backfield, and let's let these guys win that way. Let's not make Andrew have to throw it 57 yards to T.Y. Hilton for a score or Andrew have to take us on a methodical 13-play 80-yard drive where he takes five hits, including three on third downs, to deliver the football, staring down the gun barrel. Let's get some quick strikes where Andrew can just turn around and hand it off and let somebody do some damage or throw a little screen to somebody. And that's where a guy like Naheem Hines comes in to play. All right, or the guy you drafted last year that I loved, Marlon Mack, comes in to play. Guys that are explosive, that can do damage, where you can just get it to them quickly and move out of the way. Speed is the first pro, obviously, 4-3-5. What are we talking about here, folks? Ridiculous speed, which means his acceleration is off the charts. His quickness is just as deadly, if not more deadlier than his speed, because um, he's here, then he's not. And he makes such quick moves so fast and rapidly that guys don't have a chance to really react. Agility is stupid, especially out in space. Um, his vision was on full display versus North Carolina. Uh, he shredded them, tore him a new asshole, almost ran for 200 yards on about 15 or 16 carries. He had like a buck 89 or 96 or something like that stupid game where he just carved them up. Um, and his vision was some sick, nasty cutbacks against the grain uh, for some scores in that game. So the vision is full on full display there. Make your miss. Turn on the Louisville game, and he's got a, a play where he catches it out in the flats, spins twice in a row on the same play, makes two guys miss, takes a two-yard gain, turns it into a 12-yard gain, 15-yard gain, 20-yard gain. That's what he does. And that's what he has the ability to do out in space, make you miss. Don't get it twisted, though. You see the 5'8", 198 frame, and you're thinking, oh, it's a young, little, frail body guy. Nah, 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 don't get it twisted. Turn on the Florida State game and not Jalen Samuels at the end of that game when they're looking assaulted away against Florida State. Not Jalen Samuels, your big 225-pound back is getting a rock to salt the game away. But your 5'8", buck 98 back is running in between the tackles, off tackle, salting the game away in the waning moments when you need to have it. That's who they decided to turn around and hand the football to. So that tells you all you need to know about this guy's ability to run in between the tackles. Contact balance and yards after contact. He was, he was a boss in that game versus Florida State in a win on the road in a hostile environment. Um, toughness, durability, that's something you question with a guy sub 200 pounds. That's 5'8". You don't want to overwork them. You don't want to, and, and that's something that we'll talk about a little bit later on. You don't want to give them too much of the workload for fearing of them getting injured because of their small stature. But I liken him to Warwick Dunn. A lot of people want to compare him to Alvin Kamara. A lot of people forget, and I tried to explain this to people last year. Alvin Kamara last year, coming out of Tennessee, was 215 pounds, people. People neglected, they always, oh, he, he can't handle the ball all three downs. He, he's small, he's frail, he's got a slender frame. I'm like, bro, he's 215. And it's not like we were talking about Kamara being 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, he was a, a full-fledged 5'10", five, 5'11", five, six-foot back at 215. Like, people were disrespecting what Kamara brought to the table. Naheem Hines isn't Alvin Kamara, but I'm telling you right now, he's more work done. And that's a, if you can get that, Got yourself a hell of a football player. Uh, receiving ability. He can catch it out of the backfield. He's more of a swing route, dump down, arrow route kind of guy right now. He's not running crisp routes out of the backfield. He'll run a wheel route out of the backfield, catch it down the sidelines. He's got some developing to do as a route runner, but he can catch the football. Um, pass pro and awareness. Uh, I don't love him as a pass protector right now. A, he's small. 
But um, he'll stick his face in there, though. He's not afraid, but he's small. He, he, and so, you know, you get a 240-pound linebacker with full head of steam coming. He's licking his chops to get a chance to try to run over a 200-pound Naheem Hines. So um, he's not afraid, though. I can tell you that much. Versatility, I already talked about that. Guy had three kick returns for touchdowns, two on kickoffs, one on punts. So um, gives you versatility there. Um, third down back, can hand it off to him. So there's a lot of different ways you can use Naheem Hines. Uh, patience as a runner, good patience, sets up blocks, cuts off of them well, um, and leg drive is, is solid for a guy his size. You go to his cons quickly, snap volume. He didn't have the football a ton at um, – NC State, as a matter of fact, I told you that his breakout season as a rusher came in 2017, where literally 80% of his production came in 2017 as a rusher. So um, he split time, and, and a lot of times Jalen Samuels was the guy until 2017. So um, I don't think you're going to overwork this guy anyway. You've got a number of backs um, in your stable. And another back that you drafted this year that I love, and I think it's going to help you in a really talented young backfield for many years to come. Again, love what you're doing around Andrew Luck now. Uh, but the other con is his ball security. Um, here's a guy that had seven career fumbles while at NC State. And again, limited touches, yet seven fumbles, lost three of them. And it's not like, oh, yeah, he had three fumbles in his freshman year and another two uh, or three in the next year, and then he only had one last year. No, he had four fumbles in 2017 and lost one of those four fumbles. So that was an issue just last season. So that's something he's going to have to clean up if he wants to get on the field and have an impact for this Colts offense. But, man, I love this pick. Love what he brings to the table. And I feel like Chris Ballard is – he's got the blueprint. He brought it from Kansas City with him. Surround your quarterback with explosive dynamic athletes, and it limits what they have to do on the football field. And that's essentially what he's doing. You did it in this draft with some of the receivers that you took. You already got T.Y. Hilton. You, you bring um, some of these other guys on to the, to the field and into the mix. Marlon Mack last year, Naheem Hines now, and some of the guys we'll talk about later on in the draft. And all of a sudden, you got a team full of explosive, dynamic athletes that can change the game with one play. Fourth round, 104th pick overall, running back out of NC State. Naheem Hines, for me, is... Fifth round, 159th pick overall, wide receiver out of Northern Iowa, Darius Fountain is the selection. Six one, 210 pounds out of Northern Iowa, 42 and a half inch vert, 11 one broad, 44640 at 210 pounds. He lit it up at his pro day, turned some heads, and essentially his work postseason got him drafted, was huge at the East-West Shrine game, turned some heads there, turned around and did what he did. Didn't get an invite to the combine, but then tore it up at his pro day. And voila, you get drafted in the fifth round. I thought it was a little early for him. I thought there were other guys on the board. Uh, one, Deion Kane should have been selected. And you ultimately got Deion Kane um, down the road, which – was amazing that he was still there, but um, this would have been a great spot for Deion Kane. I would have loved to have seen you get Andrew Luck some height, some size, and a guy like Equinemius St. Brown. This would have been a great spot for him uh, and not Darius Fountain. But let's get into Fountain and what he brings to the table. Um, Three-year starter and captain at Northern in, uh, Iowa, and he broke out in 2017. Um, 66 catches, 943 yards, and 12 scores. That was his career high. Um, 148 catches, 2,063 yards, and 23 touchdowns in his career. So he didn't tear it up necessarily. And, you know, my one requisite for guys that get drafted from smaller schools that play at a D2 or D3, um, if you're playing in the FCS, man, tear it up. My one prerequisite is dominate the competition. Darius Fountain didn't necessarily do that. But nonetheless... Measurables at 61210. Love it. 
Yeah, that's good NFL wide receiver size. It's not 6'5", 218 like a equanimous St. Brown, but I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Hands are, are pretty solid, although I did see a couple of drops on tape, but those were more a byproduct of him trying to make something before he got the football. Uh, the guy can catch the football, so I'm, I'm not too worried about that. Speed, 4.46. Four, he can run, obviously. Quickness and suddenness. He's got the ability to not only play out wide, but also play in the slot because of his ability um, to uh, be quick and sudden in his route running ability. Even though I think he's a little rough around the edges as a route, route runner, I don't think he's nearly a finished product there. He's got a lot of work to do. He's no Cooper Cup from last year's draft from an FCS school. That is for certain. However, um, he does have quickness and suddenness um, and tempo with his routes that will allow him to win at the next level if he's able to fine-tune his skills there. Um, acceleration off the charts, obviously, he can run. Physicality and toughness, run after the catch, these are all things that he did well because they threw him a ton of bubbles and hitches while at Northern Iowa and said, hey, go get us something after the catch. So um, he developed the ability to run after the catch, having to do so out of necessity. Uh, leaping ability, high point in the football, uh, with a 42 and a half inch vert, you know the guy can get up. He can jump out of the stadium. Here's the issue. He can go up and get it, but is inconsistent in timing his leaps. I saw him go up for a football in double coverage, and he jumped too early, still out-jumped both defenders, but because he jumped too early, he allowed them to get back into the play and knock it out of his hands. Had he timed that up beautifully like he was supposed to, he would have still been going up when they would have been coming down. They would have had no chance to knock that football out of his hands, but because he went up too early, they were coming down at the same time, and they knocked it out of his hands. And I saw that on more than one occasion with Darius Fountain on tape. Catch radius is solid. Ball tracking, uh, this was almost a negative. Almost a negative. Put down in my notes, seems to pick the ball up late and doesn't leave the quarterback with tons of room for delivery of the ball over the outside shoulder. As a receiver, there's a red line that they always talk about. This imaginary red line that you have to run. If you're going to run routes breaking to the outside, i.e. a fade, you have to straddle that red line so that when you break to the outside, there's enough space for the quarterback to drop it over your outside shoulder. If you don't use that red line, then guess what's going to happen? You're going to squeeze the sidelines. The quarterback is going to try to throw it over your outside shoulder where it's supposed to be, and it's going to lead to the football being thrown out of bounds. Now, his quarterback wasn't the greatest However, he didn't do his part to ensure that there were opportunities for footballs to be placed in the right spot. And so his ball tracking and route running, not desired at this moment. Dependability and clutchness. There was a nice grab on a fourth down late in the ball game uh, versus Western Illinois. Uh, the Leathernecks. <laughs> These are the types of teams they played against. The Leathernecks. Uh, but he was the guy. And he made some plays in some clutch situations. Um, versatility, like I said, I think he can play inside or outside. But, you know, with his size, you're probably looking at him as an uh, outside wide receiver. Um, sideline awareness, put down in my notes, makes great catches by the sidelines but can't keep his feet inbound. So that was almost a negative as well. I saw him make three exceptional catches, and this kind of goes back to um, not leaving enough space on the sidelines. And some of it is his quarterback just being stink. Uh, funky and, and not getting him the football in the place. Oh, he had this one hand grab that was sick out of bounds. Uh, another one where he comes down with it, tough catch, but he doesn't get his feet in bounds. Um, but in any event, you go to his, his one con is his production. Um, lackluster production for the level of competition. And that's the one thing that nagged me here um, is look, I watched him in a game versus South Dakota and one catch for 21 yards. Like, He's supposed to be eaten every single week. They could double team him. I don't care. Cooper Cup was eaten every week. They they were putting boxing ones on this guy and doing everything they could to stop Cooper Cup. And he still would get 80 grabs for 200 yards in every game, it seemed like, watching him at Eastern Washington last year. And that's what I expect out of small school guys, and I just didn't get that with Darius Fountain. Look, I think the Colts kind of suffer from that – wow factor of what he did at the East West Shrine game and what he did at his pro day. I look at him as the new Dante Moncrief. 
a, a height, weight, speed specimen that tore it up at the combine. You, you fall in love with the measurables. You fall in love with uh, a lot of the things that this guy possesses from an athletic exploits standpoint. But the production doesn't necessarily back that up. And you may be getting a guy that de ultimately doesn't provide for you what you're looking for here in the fifth round. But it's a fifth round pick. I don't want to over exaggerate. And he may turn out to be a stud for you. But I thought there were other options available here, i.e. Equinemia St. Brown, i.e. Deion Kane. Luckily enough for you, you ultimately got Deion Kane. But to almost miss out on those guys, or to miss out on one and miss, almost miss out on the other one because you decided to take Darius Brown here, I'm not too much of a fan of that. But in the fifth round, 159th pick overall. Wide receiver out of Northern Iowa, Darius Fountain for me is. So we go to the fifth round, 169th pick overall, running back out of Old Miss. Jordan Wilkins is the selection. <laughs> This is a guy that I've always liked. I've always respected his game, um, watching him at uh, Ole Miss, pause. Um, 6'1", 216, he just runs hard. Every time I watched him, I always thought, man, this guy runs incredibly hard. Doesn't get the respect that he deserves. Um, but just, I just always admired his play because every time I would watch Ole Miss, I'm like, god damn, this guy's running hard. He's running through arm tackles. He's breaking multiple tackles just getting the most out of his talents. And he, he's not the most uh, athletically gifted dude, and he's not the guy that's going to run a 4-4 or whatever, but you just saw a guy that was tenacious, that got every ounce out of his abilities, and I can respect that, man. 4-5-40 for this guy, 10-3 broad, 37-inch vert, which is contrary to what I just said. That's very athletic, 37-inch vert, but... Um, after being a rotational guy and wrongly suspended due to academics in 2016, there was some kind of mix-up where he wasn't allowed to play in 2016. He bounced back with a phenomenal 2017 season, his best of his career, 155 carries for 1,011 yards and nine scores. Guy averaged over six yards a tote in the SEC, second in that conference, which is phenomenal. In a conference known for stopping the run, this guy was running the rock. Uh, two, 26 catches, 241 yards, and a score also in his career as a receiver. Um, so this is a guy that, um, and, and those numbers were just in 2017, might I add. So this is a, a guy that was really versatile for this Ole Miss offense. And so let's go through his breakdown quickly. Speed won't wow you with his speed, but it's very adequate. It gets the job done. I um, think he's really solid from that perspective. Quickness, a lot quicker than I expected. Um, he makes some cuts and break, breaks dudes off quickly. I saw him do it against Alabama. Now, granted, he had a 44-yard run against Alabama, ended up with like 90-some, 100 and six yards rushing on just like 16 carries granted 44 of it came with the backups in the game and Ole Miss trailing like 45 to 7 I don't give a damn Alabama's backups are good enough to start for probably 80 percent of the country so miss me with the backups on the field and there were still some starters sprinkled in there nonetheless I saw him break off a dude in the backfield break another dude off and off to the races he went for 44 yards so um a lot quicker than I expected, man. Good acceleration. Agility, I said, very decisive with cuts and can jump. And he leapt over an Alabama defender in mid-stride, hit the ground, and kept running. I'm like, and, he, and it's not like one of these, oh, God totally whiffs, you know, ducks his head, and you just got to jump over a hurdle. Like, he literally cleared this whole entire guy's body, like a whole entire jump over a whole grown man and then hit the ground and kept running like he didn't just jump over somebody. It was stupid. Um, he's got quality vision. It's really solid. Um, make you miss. Not the fastest guy in the world, but possesses a quick one-two crossover that allows him to make guys miss. You know who I liken him to? 
I liken him to Arian Foster. Upright runner, not the fastest in the world, tough as nails, will run you over, um, possesses a little bit of a stiff arm. Arian had longer strides than Jordan Wilkins does, and he was a little bit more deliberate of a runner, was Arian Foster, and could catch it much better than Jordan Wilkins can. But their style, to me, is very similar. Their, their body type, very similar. Um, the look of them, very similar. And the way they approach the game, to me, is very similar. Um, contact balance, another thing that Arian Foster did well. Jordan Wilkins does exceptionally well. Love, I love his contact balance. He pin, pinballs off of defenders. There's a run versus LSU where he bounces off of two, three dudes. They didn't wrap up, and he was able to bounce off a couple guys, come out of the other side of the hole, bounce outside, and run for a touchdown. And it, it's his ability to just bounce off of contact that allows him to do that. Receiving ability, he can catch it out of the backfield. He's not a dynamic pass catcher. He's not a guy that you want catching it on third downs per se. You've got other guys like Naheem Hines or Marlon Mack that can probably do that better than he can, but um, he can catch it nonetheless. Um, pass pro, I do not love him in pass pro whatsoever. Matter of fact, those are two of his cons. We'll come back to those in a second. Snap volume, he, was, he wasn't really the guy at Ole Miss until this past year, so uh, he never really – took the bulk of the carries, not going to ask him to do that most likely at the next level. You've got guys that are going to share the load. So uh, I think that's a good fit for him anyway. Versatility, I don't like him on third down, so I think he's more of a first and second down type of back for me right now. Ball security, two career fumbles. He lost both of them, but neither of those came in 2017. So feel good about where he is with the Rock right now. Patience as a runner. Uh, outstanding patience to allow plays and blocks to develop. Does a really good job of, of allowing things to, to develop and set up so that he can cut off of those blocks and make plays. And leg drive, he's one of those guys that's always constantly churning the legs. You get him in a pile and you see the pile move an additional three, four yards when linemen come push it. A lot of that is because of leg drive of the running back. Jordan Wilkins is one of those types of guys. So you go from all those pros to some of his cons, um, pass pro and awareness are the two things that I don't love with Jordan Wilkins right now, um, and which is why I don't think he's a third down back. I don't love him in pass pro. For as physical of a runner as he is, he's equally as soft in pass protection, I feel like. He just doesn't get it done for me. And to make matters worse, I don't know if he knows who to block at times. And if there's no one to block, I don't need you to stand there as my personal protector as if I'm about to punt the football. Get the hell out and get into the route and give me another eligible to throw the football to. And I put down in my notes, not always aware of surroundings as a pass protector as far as who to block and doesn't get into his route as a late eligible. He just stands back there. If no one comes late or no one's coming and they've got enough to block the guys that come on that play, he'll still stand back there and quarterback's like, bro, I need somebody to throw as an, as an outlet, man. Get out there. And he's just standing there. So, uh, I don't love him on third downs. That's the one thing that uh, right now I'd say Jordan Wilkins is extremely limited at right now. But I've always admired his game at Ole Miss. I watch a ton of SEC football. He's always been a guy that I thought, man, I don't know if he's going to get a shot at the, at the next level or not, but he deserves one. And I'm glad to see he got selected here by the Indianapolis Colts in the fifth round, 169th overall selection running back out of Ole Miss. Jordan Wilkins for me is... So here's a complete steal in the sixth round, 185th overall selection, wide receiver out of Clemson. Deion Kane is the selection. So I honestly don't know why this guy was still here in the sixth round. It's one of those things where it could have been a confluence of things. Um, Obviously, he had the suspension back in 2015 for weed. Um, that could have put some teams off. Uh, he had a, a really poor showing at his pro day with a number of drops. That could have scared some teams. You turn on the tape, and there's some drops there too. Maybe that scared some teams. I don't know. Maybe he, he didn't interview well. I don't know what the situation was, but he shouldn't have been here in the sixth round. I'm just as simple as that. It, it's one of those things where you just say, wow, he's still here. Let's pick him. 
And I think that's what the Colts decided to do. They should have picked him around sooner. When they picked Darius Fountain, they should have picked Deion Kane, and this should be the pick for Darius Fountain. But nonetheless, they're both on your team. Fifth round, sixth round, who gives a shit? You got both of them. This guy here, 6'2", 202, out of Clemson, 4'4", 340, 11 reps of two and a quarter, 35 or 33 and a half inch vert. Um, career stats, 130 catches for 20, 40 in terms of yards, 20 touchdowns. Um, yards per catch fluctuated over the years, 17 yards per grab in 15. That number skyrocketed to 19, damn near 20 in 2016. And then it came all the way crashing down in 2017 to 12. No Mike Williams, no Jordan Leggett eating up safeties. He had to do it on his own. He was the guy and thus less yards per completion. But nonetheless, for catch, uh, let's jump into this guy and talk about what he brings to the table. Measurables, 6'2", 202. That's fine. Um, hands are good, not great. Drops are a factor of him trying to make a play before the ball is secured. Look, I've always said this. You can't run and gun. You can't have fun. You can't ball without the ball. And some guys, they're looking to make plays, and Deion Kane is one of those guys that wants to make a play so bad. Sometimes he takes his eyes off the ball, like the Alabama game in the uh, bowl game this past year. Had a chance on a third down to catch the football, make a first down early in the game where uh, Clemson was looking for some momentum. Maybe a first down and moving the sticks, fresh set of downs. You never know what that brings. He drops it. They got a punt, and it was a rough game for them versus that Alabama defense. And dropping it wide open on a third down that would have converted it to a first down isn't the way to solve that Alabama defense. So um, he's just got to focus. Speed is his calling card. You know, 4 4 3 explosive um he's not quite dj chark from that standpoint in terms of explosiveness but he's the notch right below him and so he's got the ability to take the top off the defense and and make you pay um if you're flat-footed for sure uh quickness and suddenness nice tempo and hesitation with and without the ball so his ability to run routes which kind of takes me to my next pro him being a smooth route runner um, I think he is underrated in that aspect of his game. Um, he's going to win routes. Uh, I expect more out of Deion Kane than I do Darius Fountain. Uh, this guy's going to be your number two wide receiver when it's all said and done next to T.Y. Hilton. Hey, watch what I say. Um, if he stays healthy, if he stays out of trouble off the field, um, this guy's going to be your number two wide receiver because he's got the ability to do that. And he flourished in that role opposite of Mike Williams in 2016 where he put up the biggest numbers of his career. So... Um, I expect him to take that role and run with it. Um, acceleration, he's got plus acceleration, obviously with the 4-3-40. Four, four, he can run. Um, physicality and toughness, it's solid. It's not great. It doesn't overwhelm me, but uh, he's not afraid of contact. Run after the catch can be dynamic with the ball in his hands. See the 2016 Alabama Bowl game, uh, the championship game that they ended up winning. Early in the game, they're struggling. They're looking for a big play to jumpstart them. Who makes the play? None other than Deion Kane, with a simple slant that he catches, makes a couple of guys miss, cuts it across the field, and ends up picking up about a good 50-some-odd yards to really jumpstart that Clemson offense. So he can be dangerous with the football in his hands. Leaping ability, he can outpoint the football, but that's not necessarily his strong suit. Um, catch radius is solid at 6'2". Um, ball tracking, he can go get the deep ball. Um there's a catch. My favorite catch of his is against Louisville in 2016. We all remember that game. That was a classic game, um, one that went a long way in determining who was going to play for the national championship that year or at least make the playoffs to have an opportunity. Uh, Louisville went into Death Valley, had that game, and Louisville let it slip away. Nonetheless, um, he makes a gorgeous – he killed Louisville in that game. Had a nasty diving catch in the end zone. For a touchdown uh, and that's what he brings to the table he can go and track the deep ball uh, blocking he got mad in the Alabama game in 2017 so uh, the defender knocked the football out of his hands to play before and he was frustrated about it so the next play is a run play and he's stock blocking and he just goes up and he destroys him and knocks him on his ass 
So that shows me he's capable of doing that. I just I need to see it more. Dependability and clutchness. That's one of those situations on and off the field. Can I depend on you? Can you be clutch on and off the field? Can I trust that you're going to stay off the weed? Can I trust that you're going to be available for me week in and week out? Can you be accountable? That's something that you got to ask with Deion Kane. And I mean, I think that's part of the reason why he's sitting here in the sixth round for you to select. Versatility. Um, this guy can play in a slot, I think. Uh, this guy can play out wide. Uh, so I think because of his ability to run routes, he can do a little bit of everything. You can move this guy around and he can be a difference maker. So um, there's a little bit of versatility there. Sideline awareness, knows how to maneuver around the sidelines, had a number of catches where he had to get his feet down in bounds. Uh, and production is the last pro. Um, no cons here because he doesn't belong here in the sixth round. You know, the one thing you worry about is, you know, can you trust this guy? And again, hasn't had any infractions since 2015, his freshman year on campus. So you'd like to hope that he learned from that experience. He's grown and that this isn't something that'll bother him and haunt him moving forward. But um, the, the drops, that's something that you, you got to concern yourself with at times. But it's not like you don't know how that goes. T.Y. Hilton drops the football from time to time. So it happens. If he concentrates, and, and T.Y. is another guy that with the football in his hands is explosive and dynamic, it's not because T.Y. can't catch. It's because he's looking to make a play before he catches the football. Same thing can be said for Deion Kane. In the sixth round, 185th overall selection. Clemson wide receiver Deion Kane. I don't give these out very often in the sixth round, but you got yourself one here is... These next two players, I literally could do one breakdown and knock both of them out, kill two birds with one stone. They're the same player. You drafted carbon copies of one another. I honestly don't understand the logic other than, hey, we need more bodies at linebacker and we want more athleticism at linebacker. Let's see what these guys have. We'll kick the tires on both of them. They're the same guy, but I'll break them down individually one by one anyway. Seventh round, 221st pick. Overall, linebacker out of Houston, <laughs> Matthew Adams, is the selection. Six feet, 229, 4'6", 340, 33 and a half inch vert, 30 reps of two and a quarter. Hold on to that one. Seven and a half sacks. 21 tackles for loss, five forced fumbles, two fumble recoveries, three pass breakups, no INTs in his career. Measurables, six feet, 229, a little light, a um, little undersized, but again, in today's NFL, it is what it is. Um, he may gain five to seven pounds just being in the um, facility and in the nutrition program, and we'll see what happens with him, but nonetheless, speed. At 4.63 is something that the Colts obviously coveted at this particular time in the draft. And in any team, for that matter, at the end of the draft, you're just looking for athletic freaks or guys that got overlooked. And um, they probably saw a linebacker with some athletic gifts that could benefit them if um, he's able to take his game to the next level, at the next level. Um, there's a play here that shows his speed. Uh, he made a mistake but made up for it. Um, so Joe Mixon comes out of the backfield. I went back to 2016 in a dominant performance by that Houston defense over Baker Mayfield and the Oklahoma Sooners. And um, Joe Mixon's in the backfield, takes a quick hop step, and then just takes off on a seam route up the middle of the field, run right by, right by Matthew Adams. And Adams then is able to catch him from behind, hawks him down, but then misses the tackle. <laughs> But so is the story of Matthew Adams, but that, that's just showcased the speed. Not saying that Joe Mixon is the fastest guy in the world, but to run him down after that speaks volumes as to how this guy can run. So he's got plus athleticism, solid acceleration, redirect. Um, he can shed and slip somewhat. Not really. Um, taking on blocks, that's something we'll talk about when we get to his cons. Uh, tackling ability, loves to lower the boom. That's one of his best attributes. Uh, versus Navy, he had some nasty hits out in the flats. Some good tackles there. 
Um, he's one of those guys that love to come with a shoulder, reckless and out of control. Um, he's got to learn how to wrap up. I can see him missing a bunch of tackles in the next level, and he missed a bunch of tackles while at Houston as well. Um, had a nice strip in the Oklahoma game where Baker Mayfield scrambles out of the pocket, makes something happen, and Adams comes from behind and just rips the football out of there, goes in the cookie jar, rips the cookies out. Um, Baker Mayfield, he lit him up in that 2016 matchup. Mayfield was scrambling down by the end zone, and Matthew Adams walloped him. So uh, this guy can hit for sure. Uh, zone coverage, I saw some quality zone drops out of him, but still, no career INTs speaks to a lack of um, awareness and just not being in the right place at the right time. So that worries me a bit, but nonetheless, I did see some quality zone drops out of Matthew Adams. Uh, Blitz and capability, he, look, he ended up with um, seven and a half sacks in his career, but there's no creativity as a blitzer. You know, he's one of those guys that just runs straight, uh, caveman blitzer, you know, Run straight. Hopefully no one touches me on my way to the quarterback. Anybody gets in my way, you got me. You got me. Hands up. You got me. And so don't love him as a blitzer. There's no creativity there. Solid range. Again, 4.63 gives him the ability to move well around the field. You go to his cons. Um, awareness. This is, the, this is the thing that I think is going to ultimately see this guy either be a career backup, special teams player, or not in the league. Hesitation in space allowing for plays to develop before he reacts. This guy will just stand there and watch things happen. He's too damn patient. And what that also does, it, it allows guys to get to the second level, climb to that second level to get to Matthew Adams to put a body on him, which takes me to my next con, taking on blocks. He plays behind blocks way too much. Go make a play, bro. You can run. Go run and make a play. But he's standing there watching. He's got his binoculars. All right, I think they're going to run the football up the A-gap. Yep, they're coming my way. And let me put down my binoculars. And now the guard has gotten to me. Shit. Yeah, yeah, because you stood there the whole time and watched the damn play develop. So when he runs, when he shoots his gun, he can be dynamic. But there's that's so few and far between the amount of times he does that. Um, I, I just don't see how this guy... And then man coverage is also a negative for me. Um, I think he's just too unsure in man coverage. Um, there's times where he guesses and guesses wrong. There's times where he's just flat-footed and guys just run by him, i.e. Joe Mixon. Um, I saw a tight end run an uh, out route, and he just looked unprepared as if he didn't know that that was his guy and his responsibility in man coverage. So um, in any event, seventh round. It's a seventh-round pick, 221st pick overall. Linebacker out of Houston, Matthew Adams for me is. So we wrap this draft up. Seventh round, 235th pick overall. Linebacker out of Syracuse, Zaire Franklin is the selection. Look, I could literally just take out Matthew Adams, insert Zaire Franklin in everything I just said, essentially. There may be one or two differences here. So I'm not going to really get into this. 36 feet, 239, so he's bigger, obviously. Full 10 pounds bigger, so that's a difference. And he actually had to get down to 239 um, for his workout. So um, he was bigger than that. So we'll see what his playing weight actually will be. But nonetheless, 30 reps of two and a quarter. Have you heard that one before? Four, five, eight. So faster than Matthew Adams. 38-inch um, vertical. So very uh, explosive from that standpoint. Three-time team captain at Syracuse. Do not discount the meaning of that. Really good guy in the locker room on and off the field. You can use good character guys in your locker room. Um, doesn't hurt that he's a supremely gifted athlete as well career stats 31 and a half tackles for loss eight and a half sacks five forced fumbles eight pbus two ints um so solid measurables at six feet 240 essentially um four five eight forty guy can run he's a really good athlete can move around um acceleration redirect are, are all solid 
um, shed and slip. He does a better job of trying to defeat blocks than Matthew Adams does, but generally he finds the same success or lack thereof in getting off of blocks once he's engaged. Um, tackling ability is solid. There is a hundred uh, tackle season in there for Zaire Franklin. Um, man coverage, zone coverage are both solid. None of them great, but I've seen this guy run 40 yards down the field in the slot with a wide receiver and be right in his hip pocket. So um, he does possess the ability to run, open up and run. Um, blitzing capabilities similar to Matthew Adams. No creativity whatsoever. Um, if a running back gets in his way, you got him. Hands up. You got me. Uh, range, seven and a half. The guy can move around the field. He's got solid range. Um, cons, awareness, you know, same deal. You know, a, a guy that just takes too long to diagnose what's going on for as athletically gifted as he is. I can tell you what. I can't tell you how many times on tape Zaire Franklin is chasing the bait and chasing the cheese. I, I didn't I didn't kill him for the game versus Louisville in 2016 because it's Lamar Jackson and you know Lamar killed them and he was just going for the read option fake every single time. But then again, every player on that Syracuse defense was going for read option and Lamar Jackson was just killing them. But that being said, you know, you watch other games, like against Miami, and they're running play-action fake, and he's chasing the running back three yards the opposite way. Quarterback's already booted the other way and looking to throw the football. Bro, where are you going? And it happened to him multiple times. So, anyway, <clears throat> I digress. Like I said, these guys are really similar. Um, I don't think you need both of them, but if you have a roster spot for both of them, more power to them. In the seventh round, 235th pick overall, linebacker out of Syracuse, Zaire Franklin is... So there you have it. The second draft for Chris Ballard in Indianapolis was a marathon. 11 selections, a lot of which are going to make this roster because he's turning this thing over. And so... I think it was a quality draft, man. You really got better. Added some dynamic players at the top of the draft. A couple of guys to protect Andrew Luck in the interior and open up some holes in the run game. I think your run game is going to be really good this year with what you have up front. Just in those three interior offensive line positions, uh, the ability to move guys and create a new line of scrimmage with just those three offensive linemen are going to give you opportunities to run the football effectively. You look at <clears throat> Darius Leonard and the speed and athleticism he adds to this defense. Um, you got to feel good about that. Uh, Toure and what he brings to the table. Uh, I, I just I love what you're doing. You got you got the safety out of Ohio State that got injured, and before he got injured, he was tearing shit up. I didn't love how you handled the cornerback situation last year with uh, the cornerback out of Florida, Quincy Wilson, and not giving him snaps. But he's going to get a chance to play, I feel, this year. It's young Colts defense, young Colts team in general, all of a sudden, a team that didn't have a ton of talent starting to get some talent. So this is a nice haul for the Colts, and this is what I thought of it from a score perspective. So if you want to see the individual scores for each player selected by the Indianapolis Colts in this draft, check out the website, louistnetwork.net. Also check out the podcast, Louis T Network Podcast. That is available on Stitcher, iTunes, or um, Google Music Play, and of course on the website, louistnetwork.net. So um, check, make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so, Louis T Network on YouTube. And... Um, like this video, share it, and uh, thank you for joining me. Plenty more where this came from, so don't you go anywhere. Many more draft wrap-ups to come. I'm your man, Louis T., signing off. Remember, we're changing the game one video at a time. I'll see you next time. Louis T. Network.